All right. This fine fellow up here is our bestie from uh, Dino. Uh, Kevin Winry is head of DevRel at Dino, and he made one of my favorite things ever, Twilio Quest, which was a, a game that introduces you to programming concepts built on top of Electron. I love the interactive learning that this guy's gotten up to in his career, and I'm gonna let him take it from here. Thank you very much, appreciate it. All right. Very cool. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, kind intro. Uh, and you know, I'm, I'm actually going to put you to work a little bit, Rachel Lee, uh, at the beginning here, because uh, I, we were asked to provide like some embarrassing facts about ourselves uh, to uh, Rachel Lee that uh, they could use against us. Um, and it was it was very difficult for me to choose just one, so I had to like narrow it down to a category. And uh, to start things off, we're going to play a little game of two truths and a lie, where um, you will have to decide uh, among three potentially very embarrassing injuries which ones actually happened and which one is a lie. So. Um, to, uh, to get things kicked off. So the first option is, did I trip on a curb, fall into a statue of Tyrone from the backyard again at Mall of America, and cut my head open and require two stitches? That is injury option number one. Injury option number two is, did I uh, sustain a leg injury requiring surgery at a corporate team building event that involved bubble soccer? Or, number three, did I sustain two concussive force injuries in the same nine-inning baseball game below the belt, like where you probably don't want to endure such injuries, um, and have to have that happen twice in a single day in a single game? So I'm, I would put it to you, and perhaps even you could ask our friends in the audience to see, like, which, which one do you think is the lie of the three? We're going to do this by cheering. And also, my apologies, I am rusty. Please be patient. I was supposed to help you with this, and I forgot. <clears throat> so two truths and a lie. The way this is going to work is as Kevin calls out each one of these scenarios, you're going to clap if it's the lie. Yes. And we're going to see right. if you can spot which one of these scenarios is the lie, because two of them actually happened. That Kevin. You ready? All right, so if you believe that number one is a lie, please clap your hands. Can you restate what number one is? Uh, I tripped on a curb, fell into a statue of Tyrone from the backyard again, and required stitches at a trip to the Mall of America. Okay, who thinks that that is the lie? Okay, got a few folks who think that's the lie. All right, number two, sustained an injury requiring surgery at a corporate team building event that involved bubble soccer. Who thinks that's a lie? Okay, okay, I think All that right. one's the lie. That's pretty robust. I think that's probably more than number one. And number three, who thinks the lie is that uh, I sustained two concussive force injuries, not to the head, unfortunately, in the same baseball game uh, where I had to come out of the game twice? All right, it's kind of even between Sounds two and like three. Sounds like a tie, but I feel like the middle one is the one more people think is the lie. So... <clears throat> okay, we'll, we'll, go with, we'll go with that one. Unfortunately, that actually happened. Um, I had to have an Achilles tendon repair surgery after participating in bubble soccer at a Twilio team building event once. That you get in a lot that. of injury situations. It's, it was kind of like, it was even hard to come up with these three. Like, there's definitely more. Um, and I did play college baseball, and that happened to me twice in a single game. Uh, so that, that was not very much fun, and I was teased mercilessly for it, um, as you might imagine. The first one happened to my youngest son, actually, uh, because I am an excellent parent, and he was under my supervision, but he fell into a Tyrone statue and required stitches, uh, so killing it as a parent, obviously. To be honest, those last two were really close, so I think we're going to give it to the audience anyway. I think so. I think that was close. Yeah, I think well my done, everyone was a little well off on that one. All right. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Great job, it. everyone. You spotted it. All right, well played, well played. All right, so uh, let's get into it. Uh, what's up, everybody? Uh, my name is Kevin. Um, I'm a member of the Dino team. And today I get to talk a little bit about what's, uh, what's getting cooked up for Dino 2.0, uh, which we're hoping drops uh, later on this year. Um, so our, uh, I do want to actually take a moment first, though, to thank like all the organizers and everybody who worked on uh, putting the show together, and also AWS for letting us use this theater where you know, somehow like even heartbreak feels good in a place like this. I can't put my finger on it. 
but uh, an amazing venue, so thank you very much uh, to everybody who helped out. Um, but again, the order of operations here, we'll talk a little bit about uh, what Dino is, like if you haven't uh, heard of it before, kick the tires. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what's happening in Dino 2.0. I actually have uh, some pretty exciting stuff to uh, share. Uh, and then uh, we'll also just kind of close by briefly talking about why Dino is a thing, like Node.js exists, why do we care about Dino? And I think that's a fair question, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, kind of why that is. So uh, let's get started with uh, kind of quickly what uh, Dino is. So uh, Dino is a open source JavaScript runtime. It was created by, uh, originally created by Ryan Dahl, who uh, created Node.js. And it's uh, written in Rust. It uses uh, Tokyo and Hyper for uh, asynchronous I.O. in uh, Rustland. It also embeds V8, uh, much like the uh, Node.js in uh, runtime exists today. Uh, but some key uh, sort of characteristics of Dino are that it's sort of uh, a batteries included JavaScript runtime. So without any additional configuration or tools to install, you can write TypeScript, uh, JSX, uh, you know, and have uh, some of those, to those tools that are just available as a part of the runtime. Um, there's also a built-in formatter, linter, uh, test framework. Um, the sort of uh, philosophical thing you'd notice about Dino right away is it's a little more opinionated. There's a little bit more um, included as a part of the runtime versus uh, sort of abdicating that to uh, user land. Uh, the other thing you'll notice is that uh, Dino really strives to be like the programming environment of the browser. So rather than introducing new APIs for things that do exist in the browser or as web standards, uh, we really uh, religiously try to use web standards to expose interfaces. So a simple example of this would be uh, instead of having a special HTTP request and, a, and response object that's part of Dino, uh, we actually use the same interfaces that are available in the Fetch API in the browser, um, even in a server environment where you're um, you know, responding to HTTP requests and then returning HTTP responses. So uh, the third is probably also uh, something that's most notable, which is a uh, secure runtime by default. So uh, when you run a uh, Dino program, you have to explicitly enable access to the file system, access to the network, and other potentially sensitive APIs. So this is another uh, you know, core design decision that you'll notice in Dino. Um, in addition to the runtime, Dino also cr uh, has a cloud environment for uh, running JavaScript JavaScript applications called Dino Deploy. So it's a globally distributed uh, edge network that runs in about 30 data centers all over the world. And it's possible you've actually used it already without knowing it. So if you've used like Netlify edge functions or Superbase edge functions, um, those are actually built on top of uh, Dino Deploy. Um, and kind of the primary thing that makes it different from a lot of other hosting or sort of cloud environments is that rather than managing uh, virtual machines, uh, Dino Deploy manages uh, V8 isolates. So instead of you know, cloning an operating system, it's a lot closer to creating like a browser tab. It's an isolated JavaScript execution environment that's uh, running your code. And uh, what that enables, uh, in addition to being able to serve a lot of traffic at the edge, is very fast deploys. So uh, when you are deploying an application, um, Oftentimes, if you're writing Dino code uh, that doesn't require like a lot of uh, you know a lot of pre-processing, you upload your code, you put you merge a pull request to main, and uh, almost uh, instantly that code is available across the entire network. So uh, I think uh, it's probably more useful, though, to just very quickly show uh, a Dino application that kind of illustrates a few of these things. Uh, we'll uh, just, just want to take a, a brief look at um, you know, how these pieces come together, uh, just to give you a more visceral sense of how it works. So, um, what we have here, um, I'm not, uh, I do have a little bit of code uh, pre-written here, but I wanted to kind of call out a few operative things that are maybe different about Dino, um, especially versus uh, what you might have uh, seen in Node.js. So, um, with Dino, uh, you have, um, you know, JavaScript language features that might not be available um, without a flag in Node.js today. So like, you'll maybe notice right away, like top level await, like outside of an asynchronous uh, function block, um, which is, you know, starting to filter into other JavaScript environments as well. Uh, but the other thing uh, to point out is, uh, there are lots of APIs that we can expose that are web standards. So um, within this like HTTP server, which is just like a simple like link shortening service, is is what this code actually does. Um, you know, we do have uh, you know the request object that I was talking about before from the Fetch API, but everything that isn't web standard will be a part of this like Dino uh, namespace. So um, serving HTTP requests, not something that exists as an API in the browser. So that's part of the Dino namespace. 
And uh, another thing you'll notice is this application um, implements link shortening by uh, using a key value store. Um, so Dino KV is a, a key value database that's actually built into the Dino runtime. Um, and, and that's actually part of a design philosophy of Dino that I'll talk a, a little bit about later, uh, which is uh, essentially providing more primitives as part of the runtime um, in trying to build out like a more complete web platform for the server. So uh, again, we'll talk about that a little bit more in a bit, but um, yeah, like we also here have like without any configuration, there's just a single file in this folder. Um, so we don't, uh, we have TypeScript support again out of the box. So we have, you know, the types that we can inspect um, within uh, Visual Studio Code. Um, there is a Visual Studio Code plugin for Dino. I definitely suggest that you check it out if you uh, do want to kick the tires on Dino. But again, like mo most of this uh, is just kind of available as part of the, of the runtime. So if I go out here, um, I'm gonna run this code with uh, Dino run dash A. Uh, dash A just gives it like unfettered access to all the APIs that it would want to use. So kind of defeating the purpose of the secure sandbox environment, but it is fewer characters to run. And uh, so if I run that, um, I have a, a server going here on port um, 8000. And uh, if I bring up like an HTTP client, you know, I can post a, you know, a JSON body that I, uh, you know, will, oh, actually that's uh, pointing at uh, production, a production server, not uh, my local host. So if I point this at my local host, uh, it has a similar effect where like I'm creating like a slug and a short link uh, that forwards to dino.com. If I do a get um, against that, so once again, um, we'll switch it over to uh, localhost, port 8000. Um, that's just gonna do a 301 redirect uh, to a uh, web page that's you know, configured in the, in the database. So uh, this is all well and good, it works locally. Again, like that uh, key value database is part of the Dino runtime, so it's kind of part of my development environment without really having to do anything. Uh, but uh, it's also part of my deployment environment potentially in Dino Deploy if I uh, want that to be the case too. So um, let's go back out here and um, I'll go out to this uh, project console. So on Dino Deploy, I'll just create like a new uh, kind of blank uh, project. And uh, then what I can do is I can run uh, deploy CTL, deploy, um, and then we'll push it uh, straight to production uh, because that's how we roll uh, here during the demo. Um, and I think the project was what, week cat 11? Great, and then uh, mod.ts um, is the sort of entry point to my application. Uh, that mod.ts is actually kind of a, a a convention that's arrived from Rust, like the entry point to a Rust program is often called mod you know, ru or whatever. So uh, that's kind of where that comes from. So now um, in a few moments we have, you know, a, a new application deployed. And if I go back to my uh, HTTP client uh, for the post, I'll just kind of uh, drop that in there. And uh, it's creating a, uh, you know, a new version of the link there. And then similarly, if I just like change this to a get um, and send, the body won't actually um, do anything. That's weird. So if I send a get request, oh, I do have to provide a slug. So I think it was uh, my link is what it was called. And then uh, that again is gonna, you know, forward to my, uh, you know, the web page that I had configured. So, um, the kind of operative bit here is like, I didn't have to like provision a database uh, or like you know, set, set up any keys or anything like that. Uh, the way that my code works in the runtime locally is also the way that my code works um, in uh, my deployment environment, um, which again, I'll kind of talk about in a little bit more depth uh, towards the tail end of the presentation here. But uh, heading back here, uh, that, that's a little bit about you know, kind of Dino today, how Dino works. Uh, but uh, I also wanted to share a little bit about uh, what's going on with uh, Dino 2.0. Uh, so uh, Dino's been out for a little over uh, five years now, and uh, 2.0 will be a pretty major change uh, for the runtime itself in a couple of different ways. So um, up here, this is actually one of my favorite Hello World examples of Dino because it shows how like in a single file uh, without configuration, you can create uh, you know, JSX uh, components that you can then render out um, in response to an HTTP request. Uh, it's one of my more, uh, one of 
of the more fun, like uh, sort of batteries included examples of Dino. Uh, one of the things you'll notice in this code sample, though, is a feature that is pretty unique to Dino, um, which throws a lot of people for a loop initially, which is these HTTPS import URLs. So instead of just um, you know importing a bare specifier of some kind, as you might if you were going to require import a node module, um, you can actually use an HTTP URL uh, to specify uh, where you want to pull in that dependency from. And uh, when Dino was originally created, there were a couple of reasons uh, why we did this. Um, the first one was that it's much more browser-like. Um, the way that you import modules, like if you use a, uh, a browser that uh, supports ECMAScript modules today, um, you can specify you know, remote or, or like relative URLs within your imports in your JavaScript um, that will import modules uh, that exist on your, on your server. So um, we wanted to kind of increase the portability of code, again, that you could write uh, between both environments, and again, favor sort of the most web-like programming environment possible. Um, another nice thing is that it's decentralized. So like there can be multiple places where modules can live that, uh, you know, so there's more choice in user land where you import those modules from. Um, but it's also really, really efficient. So um, instead of downloading a whole tarball with that, which has like readmes and tests and like other stuff that you might not necessarily need in your application, you're really only downloading the files that you need for your actual software to run. So there are some like really nice things about uh, HTTP imports. Uh, however, there are uh, some challenges too. So uh, one of them being disappearing imports. And this is something that we've just kind of seen in practice as more applications are coming online on Dino, where uh, you know, a server with your dependency goes down at an inconvenient time, like when dependencies are being cached, uh, or the content subtly changes. So like if you're using a service that uh, has kind of spotty uptime, um, you might get a slightly different version of an asset than uh, the, one you, uh, the one that you originally requested. And there's, way, there's mitigating things that you can do uh, for these things, um, but it was a problem that we saw as a practical matter uh, pretty frequently. Uh, there's also a problem of duplicate dependencies. So there's no good way to know that you have you know, different versions of the same dependency or you're importing the same dependency from different servers. Um, Dino can't really do a lot to like, optimize the dependencies it's pulling in based on semantic versioning. Um, so this like, sort of spread out decentralized model of managing dependencies has some practical implications there as well. Um, there's also just some developer experience uh, problems with this approach as well, like configuring URLs is a little bit tedious. You know, it's, it's kind of nice to be able to just say, you know, npm install express, and you just get whatever the most recent version of that module is. Um, one thing as a module author that I missed right away in the Dino environment was the like ability to do like an NPM link where you're working on a version of a module and you can kind of swap that out um, in another project so you can test how your module works in the context of that other project. So um, there's a number of things that um, where HTTP uh, imports are kind of coming up short um, to the point where uh, it became clear that HTTP imports were not going to be the future for Dino. And we knew that we needed to go in a, in a different direction. Um, and this is a problem that's been solved uh, many times with a centralized uh, package manager, where you can actually do some of the dependency resolution, enforce semantic versioning, and those types of things. And of course, notably, um, in the JavaScript ecosystem, NPM is doing this job today for uh, Node.js. So we had kind of a decision in front of us where um, we were thinking about like, all right, we decided that we kind of do need to go in this centralized package management direction. Uh, is NPM a thing that's going to work for us? And we put in a lot of work to kind of figure, uh, figure out if that was going to be the case. Um, but for a couple of reasons that I'll uh, share here in a minute, um, we ultimately found that like NPM had a lot of cruft in it that we didn't necessarily need in, a Dino, uh, in the Dino environment. Um, so we uh, ultimately decided that uh, it's going to be time for us to build a uh, new centralized uh, package manager that's specifically built for Dino first. And uh, some of the features of this registry uh, are that uh, we do want to actually take an editorial stance on content that's in the, in the registry. So um, we want to actually prevent squatting um, on, on specific names of modules and packages, uh, we, and, and prevent like abandoned modules from like taking up a namespace like MySQL. And we think it's to the benefit of the developer community to make sure that like 
whatever the MySQL module points to is actually like a helpful version of that type of code. Um, so we want to kind of reserve the right to take that editorial stance uh, when required. Uh, we want to ensure that packages published to the registry uh, use semantic versioning, that they're TypeScript aware, so we can actually run uh, Dino check, which checks the, you know, the types used in a, in a module so that if it is a TypeScript module, it's something that can be used successfully. Uh, we want to ensure that there's licensing that's configured. Um, and we can also build the registry in such a way where we can retain a lot of the efficiency uh, that we had in HTTPS uh, imports. So uh, we're hard at work on this right now. Um, ultimately, this is going to be hosted on dinoland slash r, uh, which if you go to this URL, there is nothing there today. So don't uh, bother uh, checking it out just yet. But uh, we're pretty stoked about this direction. And ultimately, like what we want to be able to do is, uh, with Dino, again, we're not trying to copy paste uh, Node.js. Like we're trying to create a different type of developer experience. And we think that this registry is going to be a key part of the developer experience that we're trying to create. So how's it going to work? Uh, very similarly, actually, to how you manage dependencies in a Dino project today. So you don't need a Dino.json in your project uh, by default, uh, but uh, it, you uh, will want one if you want to kind of manage. It'll be sort of maximally convenient to have one if you want to manage packages uh, through the Dino uh, registry. So um, we actually support uh, NPM packages in Dino today by using an NPM specifier. So NPM colon whatever the name of the package is, and then a semantic versioning. Uh, you know, identifier for like which version of the package you want to bring in. So that model will remain, but we'll introduce a Dino specifier uh, for packages that are explicitly built uh, for Dino. And then to use them, it'll look very similar to how you would use the import maps today or how you would import uh, from a NPM module that has a, a bare specifier uh, as well. Uh, in terms of other ways that the registry will work uh, for private registries that we imagine there being a few ways in which that can come together, um, the registry software itself were explicitly designed to be really easy to self-host. Um, it's going to be mostly based on object storage and should have enough, like few enough moving parts to uh, be pretty bulletproof and hopefully you know, survive, uh, survive nuclear attack was the words that I heard uh, from Ryan most recently. Uh, and we'll also uh, you know, continue to be able to support private NPM uh, registries and other um, you know, software solutions that do private registries as well. For the publishing workflow, uh, very similar to if you've published an NPM module before, you'll have a dino.json, which specifies the name of your package, the version, um, and then we'll have command line tooling as a part of the single download for the Dino runtime that'll help you publish those modules as well. And if you do build a module for uh, Dino, um, one tool you'll definitely want to check out is DNT, which actually takes a Dino module that's you know, written in TypeScript and actually transpiles it to both a common JS and an ESM module uh, for Node.js. Um, so it's actually like really kind of nice to uh, uh, create code in Dino and then export that to Node.js like with all of your tests um, and be able to support both common JS modules uh, and uh, ESM from the same code base. Uh, we'll also be looking at um, you know, how to do patching um, and workspaces more efficiently within the context of a, uh, of a Dino project um, in the same way that you would uh, you know, be expected to with NPM. So um, do want to uh, wrap up here before too long to get us back on track. But uh, if you want to keep tabs on what's going on with uh, Dino 2.0, uh, definitely feel free to join us um, on the Discord and sign up for the newsletter uh, to be the first to know about uh, Dino 2.0 news. And the thought I'll leave you with is kind of why we are doing this. So um, it, the, the sort of why begins, I think, like. Uh, with some of the technical things that uh, Ryan wanted to address uh, with, with Node.js, which uh, he talked about initially a little over five years ago, I believe even introduced uh, by our friend uh, Rachel Lee Neighbors, uh, where he talked about some regrets that he had about uh, Node.js and some ways that he would have approached it differently. And, uh, but just as a point of order, uh, he calls it Deno in the talk, but it is canonically Dino. Uh, so that uh, gets super, super confusing. So just uh, as a note there. But a lot of like the technical goals of Dino, I think we could credibly claim are true in the runtime today. So it's very good at serving uh, a, you know, network requests. It is, uh, you know, the runtime is secure in such a way where it's hard to execute the same kind of supply chain attacks that are possible in Node. Um, we also have uh, built in enough into the developer experience where you don't have to install 15 different tools uh, in order to get uh, work done. But uh, building, uh, you know, a new version of Node.js 
you know, in a lower level language like Rust is not the point of Dino. Like uh, just rewriting uh, a better version of Node that is incrementally faster and better uh, is not really a very interesting reason to undertake a project like this. Um, the real goal of Dino is to try to radically simplify how software is built uh, for the cloud. And the way that I like to ex uh, explain this is uh, when you're writing code for the browser, um, your responsibility kind of begins and ends with the code where you write. You have HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. You send it to the browser. And the browser does everything necessary to you know, interface with the operating system to do the things that your code does. Um, and you just have to interact with like the storage APIs, service workers, all the things that are available in the web platform to build your applications. Um, but on the server, that's not really that's not really the case today. Like even if you're using a serverless runtime, there's lots of other services that you have to build to build your uh, stack from scratch. So we want to, with Dino, bring the experience of developing for the web platform uh, to the server as well by providing primitives like a key value store, other kinds of databases. We'll be shipping a queue uh, abstraction uh, here very shortly. And essentially like, make good on the promise of serverless, which is saying like, all right, your responsibility as a developer begins and ends with the code that you provide. And the runtime is gonna do the work of, create, of making that true for you. So making that local development experience where you can write the code and it works on your machine. And with some caveats, you, know, you put it in production and it works basically the same way. That's the promise that we're trying to make good on uh, with Tino. So uh, with that, uh, if you want to try Dino, recommend using Fresh. It's the uh, sort of next-gen uh, web framework that's built on a kind of an island architecture, which is server rendered uh, by default, sends zero uh, JavaScript to the client by default. Um, very much fun. I've recently uh, gotten into it myself, and I kind of don't think I can go back to having a build step in my web application. So I uh, definitely uh, suggest that you check it out. And uh, if you haven't already, uh, our host Carter Rabasa is an excellent karaoke performer. And if you haven't gotten to enjoy his musical stylings before, I definitely encourage you to stop by the after party because it's truly a sight to behold. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. Woo!